may be seated. We're pleased again to have with us Pastor Chris Sidwell. Pastor Sidwell, preach the word. While Pastor Sidwell is coming up, one other announcement. We will be having uh, dinner with the young people, and you're invited to come as well. Would you please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5? Our focus will be on Revelation chapter 5 this Lord's Day morning. I'd like to add two items, if I could, please, as we begin to worship here from the Word. First is, many of you have no doubt heard about the trip to Cincinnati, with the highlight being the Creation Museum. This is going to be in place of camp this year, August 2nd through 4th. We want to encourage everyone to be a part of this trip. It uh, is an incredible price. Uh, Fullington Trailways are the ones who are setting this up for us. I did a check on the room itself, and the price of the trip is just a few dollars more than two nights lodging. So they've got an incredible price for all of the activities, the lodging, transportation. It's $159 per person, round trip, round trip coach from Apollo. So uh, we do want to encourage you to go back to your churches and promote this. Uh, deadline will be coming up fairly soon. And uh, we want to get that uh, locked in. Our main goal right now is 55 seats, which shouldn't be a problem. If we go past that, we will have uh, extra transportation. So don't worry. Uh, We will get you there, but taking good care of you. So young people, uh, I'm going to lead into my second point, which is this weekend. But we would love to have you come. This will be basically in place of camp this year. So we trust that uh, it will work out, Lord willing. And secondly, let me say thank you to the Collingswood Church for hosting yet another summer youth conference. We know some had to go back early. We're glad that several of our pastors and elders could come to be here to preach throughout the weekend. And uh, it's a privilege to be able to fill in for Pastor Spencer this morning. So we are glad that you're here. We hope that all of us will continue in the things that we have learned. Well, it's very clear from the songs that Elder McCoy chose that the theme is about singing. And the theme of the conference was songs from the scripture. And we're going to see a very special song here from the book of Revelation this morning. I want us to do something, though, before we look into Revelation chapter 5, and that's go to Revelation chapter 1. Just the first few words are very, very important for us to get an understanding of where we're going this morning, even in our sermon. Revelation chapter 1 tells us so much of what we need to know about this book. It says to us in Revelation 1-1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Most importantly, this book is a revelation of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to keep that in mind. I wanted to say some things kind of connected to that as we come to chapter 5 to uh, help us to realize what this book really is all about. When I made entrance into the Bible Presbyterian Church, Dr. Backus was the one who led my examination. And there was something in that examination, among many things, that I learned that I didn't really have clarity on. And that was with the Bible Presbyterian Church that there is eschatological liberty. And uh, I didn't actually realize that coming in as a person outside of the Bible Presbyterian Church, but I found that to be the case. And some of our ministers uh, are in a particular category. And uh, the issue ultimately is, to me, not being in a particular category, though I know some make that a very important test of fellowship. A lot of times when I like to get together and discuss theology with people, my wife will sit quietly and she won't say anything. She'll just take it in. But I remember her commenting one time on, what's your position, Cheryl? And she said, well, I'm a pan-millennialist. I believe it's all going to pan out in the end, which is probably a a good way of looking at it. But one of the things that impacted my life uh, in the journey that we're still all on was one of my last professors when did some study in Pittsburgh. And the last course that I had was on end times, on eschatology. 
And the professor I had had studied under a well-known historic premillennialist. And uh, I know some of you would be familiar with George Eldon Ladd. And this is the gentleman that he studied under. Now, he had gone away from the eschatology of George Eldon Ladd, but George Eldon Ladd has impacted my life greatly. And uh, so with these things being said about end times, statistics show that if all of the prophecy experts were laid end to end around the equator, it would be a great thing. Because some of the positions that are held are really out there. And uh, I think getting back to Revelation 1.1 puts us where we should be. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we believe that he is coming. The second coming is that next great event for us that uh, when we will realize what the scripture predicts for us here in this book of the coming of Christ. So I want us to look this morning at a particular section of song. And the first thing I want us to see, and before I say that particular point and give you a heading here, when you have songs like we've sung this morning or poetry, you talk about verses or stanzas, verses or stanzas. So I'm going to break this into three verses or three stanzas based upon what we find revealed from the scripture itself. So the first thing I want us to look and what I'm calling verse one or point one as well is the song of praise for the accomplishments of Jesus Christ, a song of praise for the accomplishments of Jesus Christ. Let's focus back again here in chapter five now verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. What we're going to see, first of all, this morning is this song of praise for the accomplishment and the various accomplishments of Jesus Christ. Now, where is this coming from? Who is giving this praise? Who is singing this song? Well, we see from the context here in this section that this new song was being sung by the four beasts and the 24 elders. And they are the ones that are singing this song unto the Lord. Now, who are these people? Well, I want us just to describe them from the scripture itself. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, and see what John, our writer here, says about the four living creatures. What can we learn about them? Revelation 4, verses 6 through 8. The Bible says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and the midst of the throne... And around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So we have this description for us of this song, first of all, coming from the four living creatures. And again, to reiterate, one was like a lion, one was like a calf, one was had a face like a man, the other was like a flying eagle. And these spirit beings, these created ones of God, are there to give praise unto the Lord. You see the words here, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So there in the very throne room of God, we could call it, you have this worship and praise that is coming forth from these four living creatures. These creatures have been made to worship God. I want us to pause to think for a moment that we realize in the creation of God and what God created and pronounced good, that there was a third of the heavenly hosts that Satan led that fell from heaven. And the Bible makes it clear to us that those who fell will not be redeemed. 
There will be no redemption for Satan and his demons. Uh, as the Bible speaks about the New Testament being reserved and changed for that coming judgment when they will be consigned to the lake of fire. And so these creatures, these heavenly creatures, are there praising and their words, again, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, words that we recognize from the hymn that we sing, who was and is and is to come. So we have this being uttered forth continually by these four living creatures. But the passage also tells us in chapter 5 that there are 24 elders that are a part of this worship here in the throne room of God. So now, still being in Revelation chapter 4, let's look at verse 4 and see what it says about the elders. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Reading the various commentators, they believe that these are angelic beings as well who are a part of this worship scene that we see and the praise and adoration that they give to God. And uh, in just a moment, we're going to see another connection here. But as we go back to our text here in Revelation, these four beasts and these 24 elders, they fall down before the Lamb, having, it says here, harps, golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang this new song. Now, obviously, when we think about these spirit beings, they have been created by God perfectly, and therefore there is no redemption for them. Again, the host that fell with Satan, there is no redemption, but there is no need for a redemption for angelic beings. But there is a need for redemption to fallen sinners. And it's interesting that part of what the context gives us here are the prayers of the saints. So we, the saints here, sing songs about the work of Jesus Christ. It is a privilege for us to do so. And uh, one of my favorite hymns was sung just before the sermon. I sing the mighty power of God, thinking of the creative power of our God. But the work of Jesus Christ is so much an important part of our hymns that we sing. And so as we are privileged to have this worship service today, first and foremost, we're seeking to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, his person and work. And so there are three things, I believe, here that we as saints will continually do while we're on this earth when it comes to our praise to God. And one of the things revealed in the text here is for Christ cross work. Look at what it says here, this song that's being sung. It says that this one, the Lamb, is worthy to take the book, to open the seals, for the Lamb himself was slain and redeemed us to God by his blood. The Lamb was slain and has redeemed us to God the Father by his blood. The emphasis upon the blood is such an important part of both the Old and New Covenants and the understanding of the work of Christ, which is a finished work. We love those words from the cross that Jesus said, it is finished. We also know from the scripture that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sins. So central to us is this work here that Christ has done for us as our substitute in our place. Uh, often known as the vicarious substitution, his work in our place that he went and did on our behalf. And the scriptures themselves, the apostles, emphasize the work of this ministry and the finished work of Christ upon the cross. So we find here from the text that this song is singing this theme of being redeemed, being purchased, being bought unto God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's also a purposeful atonement. You see here from the context, and these are words that you find often in the book of Revelation, that there is a redemption by the blood of Christ, where? Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Think about the Old Testament scriptures for just a moment. Most of what was happening in the work of salvation was coming uh, for the Jews. They were primary. But the blessing that we see here 
from this passage and even understanding the New Testament was how this is a message for all nations, for all people groups. And uh, that our brothers and sisters are of every tribe and every race and every background. And God is still doing that in gathering. He's calling his people by grace and the mission work that we're involved in where people are taking the message of the good news. Groups that are still unreached, translation work that's still going on to get the Bible in their language where they can have the precious scriptures that they can read and know and learn. And so what a wonderful truth it is that God is calling out a people from every corner of the earth. And uh, the issue is not that you're Jew or Gentile. The issue is not that you're black or white or rich or poor, that God is calling them irrespective of those issues. The bottom line is these people are being called by grace and they're being ones who are loyal. They're devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that purposeful atonement that is, is not just for the Jew only, but also for the Gentiles, for the nations of the world. And then we also see here not only the cross work of Christ and his purposeful atonement, but the blessing on believers themselves. And it says in verse 10 that he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Being made kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. What a wonderful privilege it is. It is for us to be able to go directly to God our Father. You see, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And so we can have that privilege. We don't need a human priest. Unlike Romanism, which has that go-between, we can go directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we have that ministry as the priesthood that's being spoken of here and reigning with Christ. What a privilege that already that we are in Christ, some of the favorite words of the Apostle Paul, that we are in him. And being in him means the eternal life that's been given to us, but yet as we are in him and already seated in the heavenlies, as Ephesians speaks about, we have that future that is sure for us. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. But there is coming that day of resurrection when our souls and bodies will be reunited and we will reign with him forever and ever. What a privilege, what a blessing, what a song to be sung. And that is part of the song that we hear here in this passage. So truly, it's not for the angels that this song is sung as far as redemption. This is for us, the redemption that we can have as the saints of God, the holy ones, the ones who have been called by his grace. But secondly, let's emphasize in a second verse, a second stanza, a statement of praise for the attributes or the characteristics of Jesus Christ. We see the accomplishments of what he has done, the finished work of Christ. But now let's see, secondly, this statement here in verses 11 and 12, if you'll follow along here. John says, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So here we have a second stanza, a second verse. Now, as we look at this passage, and again with our theme of the conference, in verse 9 it says, They sung a new song. And being held captive here by the context, it says here in verse 11 that he heard the voice of many angels and the beast, and they were saying. So it does not say singing. It says saying. So whether they are singing or they are just speaking this, it is with a loud voice of praise of the worth of Christ. Worthy is the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain. And so again, it focuses upon what he has done for us in his cross work, the lamb who was slain, what was done for us. Of course, he had the perfect life of obedience, but he had the death that only he could die in our place. And of course, what separates us from all other religions is that Jesus raised from the dead. He is living, he is reigning, and will come again as he promised. One of the things I love from the scene there in Acts 1 is Christ was ascending back into heaven. The angels say to those there, why do you stand gazing? This same Jesus will come in the same manner. And so as Christ went up before them, he will come again. 
But there is a statement here of praise about the person of Christ. And I'm calling them attributes, trying to keep my alliteration going on here. But things about Christ that are spoken of by John as he writes. And here in this we have the four living creatures, the 24 elders, but there is another addition here to this passage. With those we find in verse number 11... That around the throne, verse 11, the number of them, of the angels here, was 10,000 and thousands of thousands. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. So myriads, almost numberless, of the angels, and they together are giving this voice of praise, this loud praise unto the Lamb who was slain. And what do they say about the Lamb? Well, they speak of His worth. And they give us a sevenfold statement of the worth of Christ. A sevenfold statement. What do they say about the Lamb? Well, look again at our passage there in verse 12. With a loud voice they declare the worth of the Lamb by saying He is worthy to receive what? Here it is. Seven different aspects. Power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, Glory, blessing. Again, power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. These are all being directed to the Lamb of who He is. Now, we could have a large list of the attributes of Christ, even larger than this. But they are focusing on His greatness, on His power, on who He is as God. Remember, this is the Lamb. This is the God-man. God coming into flesh coming to fulfill all righteousness, coming in our place. And as we'll see in just a moment, then it expands into a greater praise into uh, God himself in uh, Trinity. And the uh, Spirit's not mentioned specifically, but uh, both to the Father and the Son, we find this praise being given. So here the expansion. We have the beasts that are spoken of, these four beasts, these four creatures, then we have the elders, and now the myriads of angels that are making this song or statement of praise unto the Lamb. Well, thirdly and finally here today, I want us to see what I'm calling the sum total of praise for the awesomeness, the awesomeness of God the Father and God the Son. A sum total of praise for the awesomeness of God the Father and God the Son. And when I say sum total, we're talking about how inclusive this is, how expansive this is as all of creation chimes in with the praise to our God, to the Lord Jesus, and in this case, to the Lord and to the Father specifically. Let's see that as we look at verse 13 here in our passage. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. So this really includes all of creation as it speaks about every creature, what is in heaven, which is on earth, under the earth, in the sea, all things giving praise to God. I remember attending a conference one time uh, not too far from here, a pastor's conference, and uh, the minister that was preaching was originally from Scotland, now ministers in Pennsylvania. And uh, he was speaking about how God's creation, and even though we know that it is fallen, it's marred, and there's that groaning of creation for the redemption that is to come in the future, how the creation does what it's supposed to do. And he gave something that really made me think of... Uh, well, for instance, a flower. Let's start with a flower. And here was this was his illustration, that somewhere in the Rocky Mountains out west, in a place that you and I have never been to, or difficult access, and of course there are a lot of these places where flowers grow. And there in that remote place that we have no access, there are flowers growing, and they're doing exactly what they are to do. They're growing, they're showing forth their beauty, made by our Creator and doing what flowers do. Now, for us who enjoy flowers, ladies in particular, you can cut them and see the beauty of them, smell the aroma. But even where they are not even to be able to be touched by human hands, they are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. 
Another commentator spoke about how birds themselves make that song, that beautiful song, and uh, how that that is exactly what they're supposed to do. Talking about the expansiveness, the sum total of all creation giving praise to God. We live sort of in the country. I live on Turkey Ridge Road, and it didn't get that name by accident. Uh, you see all kinds of critters, but uh, recently my wife said there was a turkey that walked right down our driveway, and then it was a fence, and being a typical turkey, it didn't know how to get out. You know, it was just stuck there kind of going crazy. But we see all kinds of animals, and uh, we actually have a couple of cats that we own. And uh, I enjoyed one morning uh, here recently of seeing robins on our lawn and hearing their song and watching them as they tilt their head and find their worm. But uh, I was on the second floor looking down, so I had a good picture, but next to me was our cat, Emerson. And Emerson was also enjoying what he could not get at, but he was sitting there and his tail was like clockwork going back and forth, and he makes this little noise like, I'd really like to be down there right now. And uh, our other older cat, who is Ricky, my older son's cat, he's always dropping us gifts, you know, of every critter that's in our area. But again, being a cat and his nature doing what he's supposed to do. Now, we get upset when it's a little bunny or, you know, whatever. But uh, creation doing what creation's supposed to do. Well, creation, what we are supposed to do is to glorify God. We can always remember this if we don't remember anything else of what our chief end is and it is to glorify God and enjoy him forever and God's creation giving praise unto him but here when we look at this passage it gets a bit more extensive yet not in just the totality of creation but we find here that it's also given not just to the lamb but to him who sits upon the throne a picture for us of God the Father my father used to have a phrase that he would use, and uh, I guess it's appropriate even for us when we think of the, some of the deep and great truths of the Bible. He said something would blow his mind. And uh, for us, I think the Trinity is one of those mind-blowing things. It gives a charley horse to the mind. But we know it's true. We believe it of one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. But we see here from this passage that in the sum total of praise, it comes to God the Father and God the Son, he who sits upon the throne, and the Lamb as well, who lives forever and ever. So this sum total of praise comes from creation itself. And we do know from the scriptures, from the New Testament scriptures, that there will come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even those who, as yesterday, as gospel literature was being given in a period of time as we were along the riverfront, they really didn't want anything to do with that. But there will be a day when they will confess, they will have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I trust that we who are that elect remnant according to grace that we spoke about in Sunday school, that we would give the song of praise. We saw how... The passage in Zephaniah spoke about Christ joying over us with singing. And we've had the privilege already today to praise the Lord in song. And that will be a part of our eternal worship of giving praise and song to our glorious Lord and for what Christ has done for us. Let's conclude by reading verse 14 as our conclusion to the sermon this morning. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. One of the issues that is going on in the contemporary church and evangelicalism is how worship is to be done. And uh, there's been a very good point made this week, and I'm not sure who made the point, but how so much of what happens in worship is so centered upon us, upon me. Uh, has anyone ever heard of the 711 songs, you know, seven words repeated 11 times? And, you know, it's, it's funny how true that is. Uh, some of these things, there's just not much there. But uh, we as Christians have to realize that when it comes to what's being spoken of here, worship, that we are seeking to ascribe worth to God. That's why we're here today. It's not so we can feel better. Though we might feel better when we leave, there's all kinds of things that can happen and the blessing and benefits of being here. But most of all, to ascribe worth unto our God. 
because he deserves all glory and praise and adoration. He alone is most worthy to receive the praise that we give. And so that is a privilege that we have in coming together for worship, worth ascribed unto our God. And so I love the, obviously the Psalms, because we don't have any doctrinal issues there when we sing them, but for the great hymns that really give for us the truth. And some of the hymns today, you know, they don't cut it. A lot of these praise songs, they don't cut it. But songs that seek to speak of the greatness of God, the glory of God, and do so from a truly biblical framework. They, they say something. That new song that's been placed in us is a song that God has given us and a song that we truly have something to sing about. And we do, because we too can say this morning from our hearts that Christ is worthy because he was slain. He has redeemed us to God the Father by his blood and has done so from a people's out of every corner of the world. And so we do have something to sing about. The Song of Saints. What a privilege is ours. And what a privilege is coming as we have that perfection that God has promised us. The glorification in heaven when we can be here in this scene. Praising God for who he is and what he's done forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonder of the incarnation that you so loved us that you gave your son to die for us upon the cross. Father, we praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ. We thank you for his work, for what he came to do, for what he did, for what he finished. And even from our passage today, we realize the importance of the slain lamb, his blood being shed for us and the redemption that we have through him, and that people have been called from every corner of this world. We praise you and that that calling out is still happening today as the gospel goes forth and Christ is being preached. So I pray for us that are here today that we would be strengthened in our walk of faith, that we would grow in our grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, being conformed to his image. Father, we thank you for the weekend of ministry, for the songs of the scripture, and now from this song of heaven that we sing to Christ, and realizing again that this book that we have been in this morning is about the revelation of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for all blessings, and again, Father, we thank you for salvation in Christ alone, in whose name we pray. Amen.